وجه كبدر الليلة البلماء شمس الهدى طلعت لنا من مكة عين الندى نبعت لنا A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. Dear viewers, Assalamu Alaikum. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Welcome to a brand new program, The Golden Age of Islam. In this program, we will discuss about the life and character of our beloved master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In later episodes, we will also look at the exemplary lives of the four rightly guided caliphs of Islam. Now, a plethora of books have been written about the Holy Prophet ﷺ and also about Islamic history. So it is impossible to cover all of them in this program. But primarily we will base our sources on two very important books. Number one, Life of Muhammad by Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, the second head of the Ahmadi Muslim community, radiallahu anhu, and Sirat Khatam al Nabiyin, Life and Character of the Seed of the Prophets, by Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmad radiallahu anhu. Now about this book, the Sirat Khatam al Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad himself says that, and I quote, I believe that of all the biographies that have been written about the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, this book is the best from among them. That's no small accolade. Now for this program, joining me in the studio will be Ayaz Mahmud Khan Sahib, who is a missionary of the Ahmadi Muslim community serving in the additional Vagal de Tasneev department. And also with us on Skype will be Adam Walker Sahib, who is serving as the director of MTA online. Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum, a very warm welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us Assalamu on this program. Without, wa alaikum salam. Without any further delay, we will go straight into it. As most people would say, the beginning of Islam was the birth of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Adam Sahib, Ayaz Sahib both uh, would know that the famous sources say 12th Rabi al which corresponds to 20th of August 570 CE. But there is also another narration which is also cited as uh, 9th Rabi al of the following year, um, which corresponds to 20th of April 571 CE. But I want to go back slightly a few years before and talk about how Prophet Abraham links with the Holy Prophet ﷺ, because the Holy Prophet in his life would always say that I am but a fruit of the prayer of Abraham. Ha, ha, what, is, what is the link there? Zafir Sahib, the, it, absolutely. Uh, the Holy Prophet ﷺ would mention this often. And if we just go back and look at uh, the very moving story um, when Hazrat Abraham um, ﷺ, took his wife and uh, a young infant child, Hazrat Ismail at that time, alayhi salam, and under divine instruction, under the command of Allah the Almighty, settled them in a barren desert where there was nothing, no food, no water. It was a barren piece of land. And when he was leaving his family there, uh, it, it was a very emotional time for all of them. And Hazrat Hajra would ask, why are you leaving us here? And Hazrat Abraham, alayhi salam, overcome with emotion, had found it very difficult to respond. But eventually it is narrated that he pointed towards the heavens and Hazrat Hajra understood that if you are leaving us here on the commandment of Allah, then nothing will happen to us, then you are free to go. So after Hazrat Abraham salam settled his family there, we have the very miraculous incident of um, Hazrat Ismail salam feeling thirsty and then the well of Zamzam uh, miraculously uh, gushed forth from the from the ground there and then uh, a settlement came there the Jurham tribe came and eventually during that time as Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam grew um, Prophet Abraham alayhi salam would come and visit them and it was during one of these uh, visits that um, when his child became old enough to walk and uh, 
help him in various tasks, um, he saw a dream that he was slaughtering his child. And Hazrat Abraham understood this to mean a physical slaughtering and he was ready to do that sacrifice and his son was also prepared for that sacrifice at a very young age. But then Allah the Almighty instructed that this was the dream has been fulfilled and a, a, a symbolic slaughtering was meant. So no need to slaughter your child. So which has we it, emulate through which the we emulate Eid Adha absolutely. Every year. That's why we sacrifice animals every year. Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmed Sahib has mentioned something very beautiful, very insightful. He says that that dream and the fulfillment of that dream was to indicate that Hazrat slaughtering means to finish somebody's life. But it wasn't a physical slaughtering. This was symbolic. And what this meant was that Hazrat, a Hazrat Abraham's son, Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam, would be devoted to the, and would be sacrificed for the sake of Allah the Almighty. And so it was from that child and from that line that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. When the Kaaba was constructed uh, by Hazrat Abraham and his son Ismail Alayhi Salam, Prophet Abraham made a prayer, which the Holy Quran has recorded. And that prayer is that first Hazrat Abraham said uh, to Allah the Almighty, Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim, that oh Allah accept this from us, you are hearing and you are all knowing. And then he made this prayer that Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasulam minhum yatlu alayhim ayatika wa yu'allimuhumul kitaba wal hikmata wa yuzakihim that raise from among them a messenger who will recite unto them your signs and who will teach them the book and who will teach them wisdom and who will purify them. And so that prayer which the Holy Quran records was fulfilled in the form of our master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who taught wisdom and who purified not only the people around him at that time, but till the end of days, he, it, it is through him that people will be purified. And also, as mentioned, he was a, a physical project through the physical progeny of Abraham as well, right? As you mentioned earlier, the Jurham tribe was the first tribe to settle there in Arabia, as um, in those days, you know, they would search for water. So yes. through the Zamzam, that was a, a source of income as well for Hazrat Hajra and Hazrat Ismail. So the Jurham tribe settled there and it was the, tribe's, uh, the tribe chief's daughter who Hazrat Ismail married and they were blessed with 12 sons, one of whom was Kedr. And it's the Arabs who trace their lineage through Kedr. So they are directly descendants of Absolutely. Hazrat Ismail yes. as well. The, the Arabs, they, they would say that we are from the children of Ismail alayhi salam. Um, I know some people, uh, some historians have written otherwise, but Hazrat Mia Sahib has explained in his book how the Arabs clearly mentioned. Afterwards, then the Khuza tribe came in and uh, gained supremacy and then exiled the Jurham tribe. So before the Jurham tribe left, they sealed the well and also their uh, wealth as well, the their treasure, national they treasure. Had, they, they secured yes, it in absolutely. the well. And then the beautiful thing is that is that after that time, Many, many years after, it was the grandfather beloved grandfather of the Holy Prophet, Prophet who Sallam, discovered who, that well. Yeah. And that's a beautiful incident which we'll mention. But before we go to that, as, um, as mentioned earlier, there are countless uh, books on Islamic history. Um, and I wanted to ask Adam Saab actually. Adam Saab, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, we were mentioned so, earlier about some of the sources of Islamic history. What are those early books um, that you can tell us, some of the famous ones? So, I mean, I, I think as we'll discuss later, sort of in the, the pre-Islamic period, it was very much an oral tradition um, that existed and that preserved um, the history and tradition of the region. But with the advent of Islam was this birth of um, uh, of, uh, of the pursuit for knowledge. And that led to, um, to lots and lots of books and lots of genres emerging that looked at early Islam from different perspectives. Um, just focusing here purely on, on uh, you know, history books, um, we do have some some um, some really uh, quite famous books. So one is um, there is uh, Ibn Hisham's uh, history, which uh, Sira, which has uh, the recension of uh, Ibn Ishaq in it, um, which is uh, you know one of the main texts that's generally referred to. Um, and then there are other texts too, like Ibn Sa'd's Al Tabaqat, uh, Al Kubra, which is a, a, a very thorough book, um, and Al Tabari's Tarikh as well, which like Ibn Sa'd's. Uh, 
uh, book is uh, is is a long, long book that is you know these are these are multi-volume books and it and they're not just it goes the life from of the Holy Prophet, right? They they mentioned about um, early Islamic history as well. Is that correct? Exactly. They, they, the the life of the Prophet Sallallahu is like the jewel of the uh, of of the crown, as it as it would be. But um, uh, but it begins from the beginning of time, almost from Hadad Adam alayhi salam. Uh, with many of these books and then and then as the tradition develops we have books that come about later um so there's ibn al-athir's uh, al-kamil fi tarikh for example it's one example of um of a a, a, a voluminous book which uh, which uh, details the history uh, very much in the footsteps of the books that i just mentioned so adam Sabe, a question then we have so many different sources and as you would know as well that there'll be for example, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, the Holy Prophet was born in 570 AD, but then there's a narration which says he was born in 571. Um, why is it that we choose one narration over the other? What, what is the difference or what is, what is the reason? Well, I mean, it, in many ways, you know, the, uh, the, the fact that we find these differences is, uh, is a mercy in some ways. It, it shows the scrutiny to which people um, looked into, um, into history. And also sometimes the the fear that people had of Allah that they even though they they found contradictory facts sometimes they wanted to include both and they might say that one is uh, more more authoritative but I'm going to leave the other one in just because um, because there are there are sources that are there um, so we we have different ways of of approaching the sources and when people you know the early uh, muhaddithun for example the scholars of hadith. Um, when they were looking at the traditions that were talking about the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were looking at the traditions from a whole wide range of um, uh, of different criteria that um, that generally are are categorized into uh, ilm al-hadith. And you have uh, uh, riwayah and diraya, for example, which is looking at the actual, um, the uh, first of all, at the isnad or the sanad of the tradition, so the chain, and looking at lots of different ways to verify whether that was um, uh, sound and solid. You know, for example, if uh, if a chain says that um, Abdullah had heard something from Mustafa, for example, um, then it would look at all sorts of factors. You know, for example, did they even meet? Were they did they live in the same city? Did, um, were they alive at the same time? Um, and then you also have, as I mentioned before, the Raya, which is looking at the um, the actual narration itself, and it's looking at key factors, you know, which which really is something quite unique to Islam, in the sense Islamic intellectual history that it's looking um, also at the moral capacity and character of the individuals that were um, passing on these traditions. So were the people honest, for example, were they reliable, um, and then basic human faculties, did, did they have good memories, um, and, and and those sorts of uh, criteria. Adam Saib has very eloquently given a very good overview of all of these texts. Sometimes people will ask, um, and, and I hear this often, that well, there is an incident that happened where the Holy Prophet وسلم, did such and such, and they will attribute a huge injustice to him, a cruelty on his part. And then they'll say, well, it's written in such and such book, it's written in Ibn Hisham, for example. So why do you reject those incidents? Hazrat Mirza Bashir Ahmed Sahib has given a very beautiful uh, principle that we can use to sift out those narrations which are not acceptable and attributed to the Holy Prophet ﷺ and quoted in the books of Sira and those ones which are authentic. And he says that the first thing is the book of Allah, the Holy Quran. That is the word of God revealed to the Holy Prophet ﷺ and the authenticity of which even non-Muslim historians and Orientalists admit to, that this is exactly as it was 1400 years ago. After that, we have the books of Ahadith and the Siha Sitta are the most authentic. And even from there, then we move on to the books of Sira. So any narration from a book of Sira which does not accord with more authentic narrations which we find in those books or in the uh, narrations of Ahadith or in the Holy Quran, we know that this is acceptable and this is not. So there's a chain where the Holy Quran first, then the Siha Sitta, then the other narrations from the Ahadith, and then these books of Sira. So we accept those narrations which are in accordance with the Holy Quran and the more authentic narrations. And those ones which contradict those more authentic sources, we can very easily say, as Hazrat Mia Sahib has written in this book as well, that this is not authentic because it goes against a more authentic uh, narration which we have in Sahih Bukhari, for example. Uh, it's, it is an interactive program. We will like to have your questions in as well. If you have any questions about 
particular aspects of history um, do send us in. And as I mentioned earlier, there are a panel of experts that we will bring in as well. For today's program, we have Tamim Abu Dakka Sahib. Um, Aslan Nikon Tamim Sahib, please tell us briefly about pre Islamic Arabia. How was it? What were the uh, customs and traditions of Arabia just at the time of the birth of the Holy Prophet? In the ancient world in general, the women were in a very bad situation. They were despised, dispossessed of the simple and fundamental rights and treated as human goods in favor of men. In Arabia, the situation was not an exception. Although the status of women in general was very bad in the old Arab world, but we can see in history that the status of women was mostly derived from the family status. The women from royal and noble families had the privilege of ownership of properties and power, and sometimes they became regnant queens who enjoyed full power and authority. We find another example in the kingdom of uh, Palmyra or Tadmor by the third century AC, where uh, Queen Zainab or Zenobia ruled the vast kingdom in Levant and recent history and Egypt. There were many other similar kingdoms and old uh, world, uh, man, uh, many centuries before and after that era, the Holy Quran mentioned these kingdoms as Thamud, which is an old Arab civilization with many kingdoms and royal families that ruled Arabia and most of West Asia over a long span of ancient history. So we can say, in short, that uh, the women's status was very bad in general, but if they were from noble families, they had enjoyed rights and power thanks to family status, not to human values and equity. In Islam, the women in general get the rights of the noble women and much more. So we can say that Islam turned all women in the world into queens. If we head towards um, pre-Islamic Arabia at the time of the Holy Prophet's birth, um, what were some of the customs at the time? Strange customs. Um, the, the Arab society at that time, um, they were, Hazrat Mia Sahib writes, that they were indulged in all sorts of sin, um, killing each other, murder, bloodshed, uh, idolatry, uh, al consumption of alcohol. All of these things were rampant in society. And strangely, these things were seen as a, as a, as a means of pride. And uh, poets would write about um, their interactions with uh, their be so-called, you know, beloveds, and and very indecent things took place at that time. Oh, um, Jang -e Basus, the Battle of Basus, which took place just because because of someone's camel incident. was grazing in the wrong place, and a person who had said that, um, uh, who said to a, a, literally, we're not making this up. A a a, a chief said to a bird that. I will protect you, and, and, the, the, nest, the, <laughs> and the nest, and the eggs camel fell down on the camels, dropped the, nest. dropped the nest, and destroyed the eggs of the bird, and then they got into a fight over this, your camel will not graze on this land again, and the other person said, no, it will, and then the person uh, slaughtered the camel, and that person then came and slaughtered the individual who had killed the camel, and then the tribes went into constant bloodshed for and 40 for years. 40 odd years. 40 years. Uh, Adam Saab, what were some of the qualities then? We, we, we often mention the, 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 the negative aspects. What are the, some of the positive aspects in those in society of Arabia at the time of the Holy Prophet's birth? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really important point because within the region, we have this diaspora of Arabs. We have Zoroastrians, Jews, Christians that are living there, and then this big majority of idolaters, for example. And then, you know, Hazrat Mizab, um, Bashir Ahmed um, mentions in his book that you then have this um, these Hunafa or these Hanifs, these people that still hold on to the Abrahamic tradition in some shape or form, and they still have that dignity and sense of honor about them. And they're they're sort of looking onwards at these terrible things that are happening, you know, many of the things that were just mentioned, uh, and, and they were, you know, disgusted by them. Um, you know, we even find it with Hadad Abu Bakr, anhu, for example, when he, um, after he had uh, entered Islam and the prohibition for alcohol came, um, you know, he was, he was insulted when it was insinuated to him that he should um, uh, give, al uh, give up alcohol because his, you know, his response was, I never drank before Islam. Yeah, we were discussing earlier as well that the um, Jurham tribe settled there. Fast forward a few hundred years, 
uh, we come to the birth of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Just a few years prior though, Hazrat Abdul Muttalib, um, the grandfather of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, and this is probably one of my fa all-time favorite uh, narrations, the finding of the Zamzam. Uh, how did that go about? Well, absolutely. It, it is a very wonderful story. Hazrat Abdul Muttalib, um, he was looked upon with respect amongst his circle. Um, and within his tribe, um, at that time, that person was considered to be the authority and the leader of the tribe who was known as the most able and the most noble amongst those people. So there was no sense of the son of such and such and then his son and then his son. Whoever was most able, they would be accepted as the leader. And Hazrat Abdul Muttalib really had those qualities. And this incident shows that, that when the responsibility of provide, providing water to the pilgrims was came over to him, and the Quraysh, at that time he felt the need to revive and find that lost water well, to provide water to the pilgrims who were coming to Mecca. So along with his son, Harith, he went out on this search. Nobody else from the- And had a dream. And, and, well. and he had, yes, absolutely. And he had a dream about it, which is why he then went out in search for it. And nobody helped him at that time. And people actually mocked him as well, right? They, uh, yeah. They were laughing at him. Okay, what is this guy doing? Absolutely. But he continued on the basis of that dream. And eventually, he was able to locate that well. And he also found the treasure which the Jurham had buried before they left Mecca. And at that time, Hazrat Mia Bashir Ahmed Sahib mentions that other people then started to uh, lay claim. To the, lay claim. Uh, yeah. And uh, impose their authority on him. Absolutely. But I think that kind of cemented yeah. Hazrat Abdul Mutlib's yeah. uh, um, authority Absolutely. on the Kaaba. Absolutely. Um, and so moving forward, he's found the, the well, the Zamzam well is now again flourishing. He marries, but there's an important part as well of that. He just at the, at the lowest point when people were mocking yes. him, when he hadn't found it, yes. he um, said he, to Allah, he made a that vow. He made a vow. He said that, "Oh Allah, help me find this well, and if I am blessed with ten sons who grow up to adulthood, I will sacrifice one of them in your way." Um, and, and, and when he did eventually find the well, he um, was a man of his word. He went, had ten sons. Allah blessed him with ten sons, and he drew lots with all of them, and the lot fell to his favorite and beloved son. Hazrat Abdullah, who is the youngest, and he's the father of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu And this put him in a very, very difficult situation because um, he, obviously he loved all of his sons, but Hazrat Abdullah was a special um, you know, son to him, had a very close relationship with him. So sacrificing him would be um, you know, unimaginable. But then again, he was a man of his word. So as he was going, taking him, and the beauty in this uh, incident as well, is that of course we can't compare the people, Prophet Abraham and Prophet Ismail, but Look at the incidents, very similar. Yeah. Abdul Muttalib said to his son, I made a vow, I need to fulfill it. And Abdullah very willingly says, puts his life on the line, says, I will obey. And just like Prophet Ismail, again, he, he said the same thing. Un, un, uh, no ifs, no buts, no, um, you know, he did, he, no hesitation. So that was another beautiful um, yeah. in, incident there. So he, as he was going to the, slaught, to the place where he would be slaughtered, the Quraysh try and stop him. And what? Why? Because the Quraysh said that, how can you sacrifice Abdullah? He is, he is a man of so many qualities. Exactly. And then, um, then what happens? And then they, they said, why don't you put his name and then 10 camels in, instead? And so they would draw lots and every single time the name of Hazrat Abdullah would come. So they would increase the number of camels against Hazrat Abdullah. Uh, and eventually then when they had put in 100 camels, then the name of um, the camels came that you should sacrifice the camels. But then Hazrat Abdul Muttalib then took the lot a, a second time. And then to confirm it was again the camels. And then he did a third time. And then the ballot for the camels came and then they sacrificed those hundred camels instead. And this, this, this concept of taking lots and pulling out ballots, this was something which was a part of the Arab society at that time. They would often... Uh, um, leave many of their matters to this sort of chance, uh, taking one thing over the other. But in any case, in this case, uh, this is why then uh, the life of Hazrat Abdullah was spared and those hundred camels were sacrificed instead. Again, such a beautiful similarity between the incident of Hazrat uh, Abraham and his son Ishmael salam, and Hazrat Abdul Muttalib and his son Abdullah. Absolutely, Yaz. Let's fast forward slightly a few years. Adam Saab, 
We are talking about Hazrat Abdullah and his sacrifice um, that the, the, the camels were sacrificed instead of him, a hundred to be precise. Now he is a young man of 25 and he gets married to Hazrat Amina, uh, a noble woman from Yathrib. Tell us about this marriage. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there, there are two marriages that actually take place at the same time. So like you say, this is some time forward and it's, uh, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a few months before the, uh, uh, the occurrence of the Sahaba feel. And, um, and what we have here is you would, you know, um, I think you were talking earlier about the, the amazing qualities of Hazrat Abdullah and how, uh, you know, it was said that he shouldn't be killed because of, um, uh, because of those qualities. And then uh, um, that uh, Abdul Muttalib then um, wants to to marry him, and he looks for someone with similar qualities. So he finds uh, Hadad Amina bint uh, Wahab, who was from the uh, Banu Zahra tribe, um, and she has this reputation, you know, that she's earned through through her her her, her character and her qualities to have to be very uh, noble woman. Um, and the narrations differ as to what age she is at this time. You know, whether she's um, seventeen or twenty five. Um, and then they they're married, but at the same time, Hazrat uh, Abdul Muttalib also um, uh, marries uh, a cousin, um, uh, Hala bint uh, Wahab, as well. To um, at the same time, and uh, and she later on gives birth to Hazrat Hamza, um, radiallahu anhu. Um, so we have this occurrence of these two marriages, and and one marriage, um, you know, the the second of the marriages uh, gives uh, rise to the birth of Hazrat Hamza, radiallahu anhu. And uh, and obviously with the marriage of Hazrat Abdullah and Hazrat uh, Amina, we have this, uh, you know, the Hazrat uh, Fatima Nabiin and, and, and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his, his birth takes place. Absolutely, gentlemen, a lot to cover as well in this program, but we are coming towards the end of the first episode. Um, dear viewers, this is an interactive program. If you would like to send us questions about um, anything to do with the history of Islam or your queries, send us um, your video messages. Um, the information is displayed on this screen. Let's look at today's question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Usama Hanifu Mpogo. I am from Morogoro, Tanzania. My question is, I want to know the incidence of Ashabul Fil. Please, if you could explain it. Jazakumullah for that very topical question. Ayasab, Ashabul Fil. It actually took place just before, uh, one year before the Holy Prophet's birth. Absolutely, Zafir. If we look at uh, the historical account of that time, we will find that um, during the time of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib, um, there was a, a, a region, uh, Yemen to be precise, uh, which was ruled by the African sovereignty of Abyssinia. And uh, that was a center for Christianity. So naturally, the people of Yemen and the ruler, the viceroy of Yemen, uh, he was a Christian. And his name was Abraha al-Ashram, a very famous name in history. Um, famous because of the manner in which he uh, stood up against God and the way that God uh, brought about his end, um, which is here for all times to remember. So he had a lot of enmity in his heart. He harbored a lot of enmity against the, the Quraysh and the Kaaba particularly, and this really bothered him. Why do people go and perform pilgrimage in the Kaaba? Because obviously he felt that when people go to pil for pilgrimage to Kaaba, the, the importance of the Kaaba also adds to the importance of the Quraysh who, and the people around the Kaaba who are the custodians of that place. So he built a place of worship in his own land and he invited people to come and do pilgrimage there. And how could the Arabs accept this? They were a people of... Uh, uh, you know, who, who had a lot of sense of national identity and they couldn't accept anything else being built in comparison to the Kaaba. So one man, uh, out of his uh, <laughs> anger, um, to, dis to degrade and to show his contempt for that other place which Ashram had built, he went and he relieved the call of nature um, inside that place to show how detestable he thought that place was. And this sparked the fury of Abraha and he took his army and said, I will go and destroy the Kaaba because of this insult. Some narrations say that he came with an army of 60,000. Um, but in any and, case, and the Quraysh had no way to combat the, that. The army. Quraysh didn't have anywhere near that amount. Um, but anyway, so he brought his armies 
uh, they, they're called the Ashabul Fil because the people of the elephant, because they came on elephants. And that was something which was new for the Arabs at that time. But in any case, he came. And when Hazrat Abdul Muttalib found out about this, of course, all of the people sent their leader to go and save them because they were worried about what would happen. And Hazrat Abdul Muttalib, the response was just beautiful. When he went and met uh, Abraha, he said to Abraha with courage and dignity, he said in a very awe-inspiring manner that your army has seized my camels <laughs> and I would like you to return my camels. And Abraha looked at him in astonishment and said, I had heard so many great things about you that you were a very noble leader who is a very, very well known as a man of many qualities in your pe amongst your people. I have come here to destroy the Kaaba and all you care about is your camels. What a, what a strange thing to say. And the response that Hazrat Abdul Muttalib gave as a result was even greater than his first one. <laughs> he said, I am the owner of these camels. So my concern is with them and I would like you to return my camels. As far as this house is concerned, the Kaaba, it also has an owner and a master who is Allah. He will protect it himself. He doesn't need me to come and uh, speak on his behalf. And then we see what happened after that. Exactly. Uh, Adam Saab, how did this incident of Ashab al-Fil end? So, I mean, after that um, amazing response, um, obviously, Abraha was uh, was enraged by that. So he said, OK, as Ayaz have said, let's uh, let's see how the owner of this uh, of the Kaaba will uh, will protect it. And then he directs his forces to um, his army to attack. Um, so they, you know, they try to to move the, the the camel in the direction, because obviously the camel would be something really uh, sorry, the elephant, obviously it would be something very intimidating as well. Um, but each time that they tried, it, it, it wouldn't move. Um, it refused, and uh, which must have been incredibly embarrassing and, and added uh, salt to the wound. And then um, something absolutely miraculous happens and, and devastating for Abraha's army. The um, birds come and they and they drop um, dirt or soil or something that, that, that falls upon Abraha's army and, uh, and it, it's uh, contagious. You know, perhaps they'd flown in um, from uh, from a region where they had become infected with disease, which you know we 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 have seen in recent years in our times um, here in terms of how uh, bird flu and whatnot. Um, but uh, but they they infect the army and every person that um, that becomes infected, they uh, they become ill and they they die. It's a it's a fatal um, injury, you know, to the degree that it said that the um, that those who contracted it. Um, and you know, particularly Abraha, that the the disease affected them in such a way that their skin or their flesh uh, began to fell uh, to fall off. Um, and obviously, in the Quran, this is mentioned. Um, uh, you know, in in sort of field where it, it, it mentions the the this incident and what happened here. Um, and ultimately, they're defeated, um, and and they don't succeed. And uh, you know, Allah defended the uh, uh, the the house, Allah, you know, his house. And in fact, this incident was so important that it was known as the Amul Fil, the year of the elephant. And it was etched in history for all times. And as a probably mark of um, like a, a warning for other people as well, not to contest with the Kaaba and God Almighty. Um, dear viewers, that's all we have time for for this episode. Um, stay with us same time next week. Um, and we will bring you another episode of the Golden Age of Islam where we will discuss the birth of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his early life. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu. Inni ra'aytu al-wajha wajha Muhammadin Wajhun kabadir al-laylati al-balmah